We love taking a look at the ancient grains and the practices of old that just suit sustainable farming and long-term planning, but we're not totally against new age gadgets and innovations. We love innovation, and new grains are no different. And nothing tickles an agriculturist like watching a new strain develop over time. Even if you don't want to take on the new guys on the block anytime soon, remember, creating new strains of any plant sort is nothing new. How do you think we got red strawberries, orange carrots, and corn on the cob? All of them used to look a whole lot different a thousand years ago, but we selectively bred them to be what they are today. And the process isn't all that much different now than it was in the Mayan Empire or for the farmers in the Middle East that have been experimenting since before biblical time. So let's get into another brand new grain. Only this one has been so well received that its importance has been compared to the moon landing. Seriously, how this remarkable step forward has been almost completely overlooked on a global scale is an absolute tragedy. Now, before we get into the new variety of rice, we first have to look at the rice that's on your dinner table now and the challenges that it brings to produce this staple that feeds the world before we can understand just how groundbreaking this new strain is. Rice feeds billions of people a year, and it serves as a staple food of the whole of Asia and a great part of Africa too. Like corn, it is one of those crops that if it should fail or a new disease comes by to wipe out even just one quarter of the world's yield, the entire food system would crumble. It's just too important a crop to allow for us to rely so heavily on its successful harvest so completely. But rice is a finicky thing to grow sometimes. Pest pressure from rodents and birds are enormous. That's one of the reasons the fields are flooded during its growth, to make it more difficult for the critters and bugs to reach. But all that flooding releases more gases into the air than it should, causing a whole lot of damage to the environment and the atmosphere that we can't afford to add because of all the other junk we're pumping into the air already. Commercially grown rice is also an annual crop, yielding only one major harvest a year. Yes, we add a bunch of fertilizer to increase growth to buy us a few months' worth of early harvests, but that affects the nutrients in the plant if they're forced to grow too fast, meaning that one of our main foods have now become nutritionally deficient. And since we're on the subject of fertilizer, let's look at the sheer amount of chemical aids we're using to feed the growing population. We won't get into how bad those chemicals are for you or the environment. That's a discussion for another day, but it's absolutely astounding just how much we're using on rice paddies to get them through to harvest time. It's undoubtedly one of the crops that get the most chemical pressure on the planet. Then there's the fact that all of these chemical aids, the uh, losses, and the manual labor required has become more and more expensive to keep up with every year. Rice is supposed to be an affordable way to feed your family, but the way to farm it isn't. But what if you could get a field to produce twice in one year instead of just once? And if you could make it more resistant to disease and to the weather, and the fact that you don't need to pull out and reseed after every harvest will lessen the manual labor greatly. Well, most of your problems would be solved right there, wouldn't they? Creating a perennial grain that has a decent yield isn't a new idea at all. We've been trying to develop just this for quite literally hundreds of years. But the differences between annuals and perennials from a genetic standpoint, even if the species are related to each other, is just too vastly different. No matter how hard we tried, we just couldn't make it work. And by the 1980s, we'd all but given up trying. That's what China wanted to do to tackle the old problem again when they came up with an idea in 1996. For three years, they went out looking for possible species of rice that were longer lived, in other words, perennials. They were able to find a few African grains that still grew mostly wild, and they didn't compare in yield to the annual varieties. That was to be expected. Any plant species that only has a single season to grow will pull out more seed heads to repopulate at the end of their short cycle, whereas longer lives plants have many years to plant forth, so they just don't put out as much as in a single seeding. The annual variety they decided would be best suited to start working with came from Thailand. And you can probably see where this is going. The plan was to crossbreed the high yield of annual rice with the longevity of perennial rice. That can give you a commercial level harvest for many, many years. In 1999, the International Rice Institute, located in India, became aware of the studies getting underway in their neighboring country, and here something astounding happened. China and India haven't exactly been the best of friends, and from a land mass and political standpoint at least, they've never been on the same page. But when it came to rice, the two countries, both culturally and economically tied to the grain, could definitely agree to see eye to eye. And it helps that scientists aren't usually too fussed about what the politicians have to squabble about. 
In the lab, they all agreed that feeding the billions of people reliant on rice, the statistics and the results mattered more at the end of the day. And since both countries would benefit from the project, if it was successful, both sides were willing to supply the funding needed to make it happen. But four years in, there just weren't enough results to validate any more money going in, and all of the funds dried up. The hopeful project was all but dead. But the scientists were not willing to give it up. They knew they could make it happen, so they went out, and starting in 2007, the next five years, they gathered up all the support they needed all over again to start from scratch. They even got the University of Illinois and the University of Queensland in the USA to come on board. Finally, in 2018, the project revealed that one of their crossbred specimens, called PR23, had survived for multiple years, and it had the high yield of its Thailand genetics. And they'd managed to get it to that point with virtually no chemical aid, just simple cross-pollination. That's it. Nature itself decided that it liked this little hybrid, and since that initial crop showed so much promise, they've been replanting from that original batch so that the genes could stabilize after every new generation. Now, the world was paying attention. It wasn't just the scientific community and the universities anymore. Now the grain had the potential to make money. That changes things significantly. The business side of agriculture is unimaginably huge, and it supplies and profits from more than 8 billion people, after all. And they jumped into the fray. Whoever had the most stakes and shares in this project would undoubtedly reap the most rewards from the final product. And given that we didn't pump tons of radiation and whatnot into its development, meant that farmers and consumers wouldn't be hesitant to pick it up after it gets released. In 2022, it was released on the global market. And this study and the success of it has laid the groundwork for many, many others like it. Back in the 90s, when China first toyed with the idea, their successes inspired others to pick up all sorts of staples. From sorghum in Africa to sainfoin in Palestine, silflower in Europe, and the very successful experiments with Kernza. Actually, we should probably put all of those studies and milestones on our docket for future videos. It becomes a fascinating world on the field lately. The focus isn't on making a plant produce more in one yield. It's about getting it to last for multiple harvests instead of just one massive one once a year. It's this change of thinking that's probably the most monumental breakthrough of all. Previously, we've bred animals and plants to give more and to give it faster. This required them to grow so fast that they lost their nutrients and health that in turn fed us a nutritious and healthy diet. Not only did the grains and animals suffer, so have we. But by strengthening the genes, allowing them to put down roots and produce at the end of each season like all of the other perennials do, they aren't being pushed to achieve the impossible in the shortest amount of time, meaning that they'll end up retaining more of that nutrition that we need. And then there are the other pros. For one, if we aren't tilling over that field every year to put down a new field, the microbial life stays intact. With more microbes and good bugs, there are more soldiers taking care of the destructive insects, so pesticide use goes down. Lack of tilling also reduces carbon emissions from the soil and the machines needed to do the tilling. And then there's the huge relief in cost. Manpower, yearly seeds, and less chemical aids adds up to billions upon billions of dollars saved each year. And to put the cherry on the cake, most of these studies aren't using huge commercial farms to grow their experiments for them. They're making use of small operations and farmsteads. They actually want soils that haven't been depleted and overly saturated with Frankenstein products. This has allowed small operations to get access to these high-yielding, long-lasting crops that we don't have to get most of the time, giving them a foothold into a market where they are drowned out by larger corporations all the time. It's a win for everyone. The big leagues, the small operations, the scientists, and most of all, the people who get to eat for less cost and more availability. This is why we get excited about new advancements. It's not just about feeding more people and making more money. It's about supporting the small-scale farmer and affecting the environment positively instead of negatively. Mankind is going to be making advancements for as long as we're around. Cars, our homes, our phones, and yes, our food too. It doesn't all have to be regarded like an alien invasion. Or what do you say? Is this the answer to feeding twice the amount of people, potentially slashing world hunger into absolution? Or are we toying with forces beyond our kin, and we should stay with the old ways and the old grains where it's safe? But is it really safe? We haven't been able to feed the world efficiently and healthily for nearly a hundred years. If we don't make these advancements, and just one sector of agriculture takes a hit, millions could starve to death. We say, if the world's population is going to be this great, 
then our crop advancements had better be just as big to keep up with us. And if it's improving the health of our soil, the air, the people who eat it, and the economy, is there really that much to lose out of the deal? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. It's the people who will be planting and consuming the new grains who will be the deciding factor after all. And without your feedback, the conversation on the ground, this is going to be decided for us no matter what our opinion of the matter is. And like always, leave a like, subscribe, and have a look at the other videos on your screen right now. If you like this one, you're going to find plenty to interest you on the rest of our channel. Until next time, love the land and it'll love you back tenfold.